Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Connected by Glass. My name is Rob Cassetti, and I'm the former Senior Director of Creative Strategy and Visitor Engagement for the Corning Museum of Glass, as well as the former Design Director for, for Stuben Glass. Thank you for joining us this evening, and tonight we're going to have a real treat to discuss the creative process behind Stuben Glass, one of the most widely recognized brands in commercial production, which got us start right here in Corning, New York in 1903 and continues to this very day. I'm happy today to welcome our three panelists uh, to discuss Stuben, and these are some of the people who bring the brand to life, to bring this amazing material to life. We have designer Eric Hilton, who has worked with Stuben for over 40 years and joins us today from Odessa, New York, a village located less than an hour from the museum. Welcome, Eric. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Great to see you. We have designer Taft Schaefer, who has worked with Stuben for over 20 years, and she's joining us from Exeter, New Hampshire. Hello, Taft. Hi there, everybody. Nice to be here. And uh, our final panelist is St Steve Bender, and Steve's a business manager for Stuben, who's been with Stuben for over 20 years. Welcome, Steve. Good evening, Rob and Taff, Eric. Nice to see you both. This reminds me a little bit of the old days of uh, sitting around the table in New York City at the design review when designers would come in every every month with their latest ideas and uh, um, marketing and business managers would join us. and. Uh, we'd all be looking for that elusive thing that's called Stuben. And um, this is quite a, a panel to bring this discussion together. We're gonna talk for about 30 minutes uh, as a panel and then open some time up for visitor um, Q&A. Please post your questions on YouTube or Facebook as we go, and we'll do our best to, to answer your questions. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, start our discussion with a quote from Tom Beekner. Tom was the founding director of the Corning Museum of Glass and the president of Stu second president of Steuben Glass after Arthur Houghton. And Tom was extremely interested in the prominence of design and artists, designers and artists in the shaping of the Steuben brand. And he said, in considering our future, our best potential course may lie in interpreting the work of artists for our market rather than interpreting the market for our artists. So really from the very start, Stuben was an artist-driven brand and that really found its expression in materials, craftsmanship, and in design. So as we, die, design, as we uh, begin our discussion, I'd really like to start with Steve Bender. And Steve, why don't you give us a brief history uh, about Stuben? Well, sure, Rob. Um, hard to do it briefly, but we'll, we'll get to this shot. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Stuben's been around a long time, 117 years, founded in 1903 uh, here in Corning, um, actually, which is in Stuben County, which uh, is how the, the brand got its name. It was founded by an English glassmaker named Frederick Carter, uh, who led, led Stuben for uh, the number of its formative years, primarily making colored glass, decorative objects, bowls, vases, um, that, that sort of thing. And, uh, Corn also in, in Corning was a company called the Corning Glassworks, which took ownership of Stuben in the late teens. Stuben really went under uh, underwent a, a big shift in the 30s uh, when a new material was developed that moved Stuben away from colored glass and into this beautiful clear material that that is synonymous with Stuben today and, and over the last many many decades. Uh, Stuben really gained prominence in the in the 40s, 50s, and 60s under the the leadership of Arthur Houghton, and transformed this into the luxury brand that that uh, people know uh, today. It it gained prominence by becoming the uh, you know the gift of presidents. Every president since Truman has given a piece of Stuben during his time. Uh, and it really comes about from a winning formula that Stuben developed back in the 30s, which not only was this fantastic material, but as you mentioned, also this, this marriage of great design and, and also great craftsmanship. Uh, so Stuben um, really took prominence at that point. You know, markets shift, trends change, tastes change, but Stuben is kind of this iconic, timeless brand that uh, 
uh, has, has really been able to sustain itself through challenging times, successful times, and, and you know, right on through till today. I think we have a slide that shows an interesting convergence of the sort of design philosophy of Stuben. And uh, I wonder if we can pull that up. The, uh, this really speaks to Arthur Houghton's philosophy design. It's, a, for, it's, a, it's an old image and I'll translate. On the left, it says good taste without the luxury of design. And you can see a, a flask, a uh, laboratory flask. On the right, there's luxury of design without good taste and a very ornamental object. And in the middle, this kind of sweet spot that Arthur Houghton envisioned for the brand, which is good taste with luxury of design. And it's, it, there's a Steuben olive dish in that convergence, but interestingly enough, also uh, a piece of Pyrex. So this was kind of a universal philosophy of design that Houghton saw as applicable to design, but really uh, applicable across the spectrum of, of products, uh, at, which at that time were made by Corning. Taft, um, let's, let's um, actually, Eric, let's start with this, the, the senior voice at the table here. Um, talk about how you came to Glass and to Stuben and the, the magic that followed. Well, as you know where I'm from with this accent, and um, I went to Edinburgh College of Art all these years ago, and uh, I went through the usual uh, sort of uh, courses one had to get to to take to get one's degree. Um, so I did the, the the primary stuff into the secondary stuff, and I found this department at Edinburgh. It was the glass department, and. Uh, I uh, thought, oh, I'm going to have a wee look at this, and so I went to investigate it, and I started to fall in love with the complexity and possibilities of what was going on down there in that glass department. So, lo and behold, I took all the courses and graduated from Edinburgh, and at the end of my postgraduate year, I was lucky enough to be offered a position at the art college to teach, uh, develop a new foundation studies program which was a two year program after which they said, well, that was great. Now open the cage and fly away. Uh, and uh, I flew away down to Starbridge College of Art, which of course Starbridge being one of the centers of glass in England. So I taught there for six years in the glass department, which was a fully fledged glass department with all the accoutrements one wanted to make it with glass blowing and kiln work and all that. And after that, I uh, went to Birmingham College of Art, but uh, that was a bit of a failure because uh, <clears throat> they ran out of money and they decided they weren't going to do it. So after that, I thought, oh, well, what am I going to do? And I knew there was an interesting country over the other side of the ocean called Canada, actually. And I got a job teaching in the University of Victoria in British Columbia to start some different kinds of design programs. Um, but the politics got really bad there. But fortunately, I had some contacts in a place called Alfred. And I uh, went down and visited them. And I got a job teaching at the State University of New York at Alfred in the glass department. And here the tale starts because I was working down in the kiln room and I noticed a couple of gentlemen standing watching me teach and the students. I said to one of them, have you met that guy before? I said, oh, that's Tom Beekner. He's president of Stuben. I said, oh, so Tom came over and he says, are you Eric Hilton? I said, uh-huh. He says, well, you know, I've seen your work in New York in the Heller Gallery. And I sort of love to you to come along and discuss with us a few possibilities and ideas. Well, needless to say, I got on my bicycle that day and drove all the way to, to, uh, to Corning. And Tom and I met and we went up to the executive lounge in these days. And here I am, you know, a kind of hippie looking guy from a university with an embroidered shirt. And he looked to me, he says, you're not going to get in to have lunch with us. I said, what do you mean? He says, you haven't got a tie on. So Tom went and found a tie, and I was really strange with this tie and an embroidered shirt. And we sat there talking to the then uh, Paul Schultz, who was running the design department at that time. And Tom turned around and he says, well, 
What would you like to do for us, which is like the quote that was just uh, quoted a minute or two ago. So I said, well, of course, I'd like to uh, design possibilities for you to do some work and see what you feel about it. I said, but I'm going back to Scotland for a month because um, I had bought this wee house on the north coast of Scotland in Sutherland. It's, it was derelict and we were going to repair this. It looks right out to the North Atlantic and there's these incredible mountains behind. So he says, OK, he says, what to do? He says, go back and you go and work on your house and also sit there and do a load of drawings for us and send them to us and we'll discuss it. So home I went and uh, did a whole a number of drawings and sent them off to him and sat there kind of wondering if he was going to respond or not. And uh, what then happened was a telegram boy arrived at the door with a telegram in these days. And it said, take it away to Edinburgh Airport, please come over. <laughs> so Eric, you, uh, what, what an introduction to Stuban and the, the, that vision of Stuban of unleashing an artist's talent to, uh, to see what the artist can discover in the material. I'm, I'm curious, Taff, how, how you came to Stuban and uh, you followed in the footsteps of Lloyd Atkins, who wrote the book on the design of Stuban hand coolers. And, um, and here you come to the story uh, as a young designer. And uh, what was that like for you? Well, it was, um, it was a pretty amazing opportunity. Um, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design and initially I went there to study apparel design. And promptly after a semester, I wanted out and I wanted to get into sculpture. And you'll never guess who let me into the sculpture department, Dale Chihuly, <laughs> <laughs> who was, you know, currently head of the sculpture department and also had just founded the, the glass department. So everybody's upstairs blowing glass. But I, I went into carving stone and wood. You know, it's a reductive, stylized um, form of, of sculpture. And so I, I and I cast bronze also at, at um, RISD. So I had those um, three media that I worked in and, you know, there's often said that there's like a RISD mafia. Everybody kind of helps each other out. So um, through a mutual friend, um, Joel found me because he was looking for someone to take over as, um, uh, you know, Lloyd Atkins was kind of phasing out. Mm -hmm. And um, this is Joel Smith, the uh, designer at Stuben. Jo yes, Joel Smith. And at the time he was a senior designer, not the creative director. Um, but anyway, talk about unleashing somebody. So I just I, I signed on. I did a couple of freelance pieces and um, Joel and I hit it off and everybody was so welcoming there at Stuben and really super help, you know, helpful because um, my Aesthetic was similar, but I really didn't know anything about glass. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot to learn and a pretty steep learning curve for a couple of years. And the glass blowers were really helpful. And the technical stuff with hand coolers is um, crucial to to nail down. Um, right. It looks it looks like a simple thing, but it's not. It's incredibly difficult technically. It is. Yeah, because, you know, if you can picture a glass, a, a big metal mold that opens like a book, it has to open up so that it doesn't break the glass as it's coming out of the out of the mold. So anyway, to um, your a point about unleashing someone's abilities, I think that's one of the key things about Stuben is they recognize that freedom of, of, of thought and freedom of design and letting a person who's, you know, artistic sort of um, explore within the, the realm of what's possible with glass and the, you know the various techniques at Stuben, um, have the freedom to explore. So those design meetings were critical. And you know we each had our own strengths, but yet we would all support each other yeah. and try to bring out the best in each other. Um, so I, I, I think the it's I love this idea that the the it, the image of Eric in, in Scotland sketching away, dreaming up dreams of what it could be and you doing it something quite similar. 
And then these design sketches would end up on on this table, this the monthly design meeting, if not more frequent. And my experience in as a designer for Stuben was that um, it became Stuben when it wasn't about the glass and it wasn't about the designer and it wasn't about the maker. It was somehow this fusion of all three things. Mm -hmm. And I and I remember clearly looking at the designs of Eric's and, and your staff and and the, you wouldn't what, what people would say around the table and it, and it was I think people did it subconsciously is they wouldn't say, oh, that's the one or that's the design or that's a really good one. People would stop and they would say that is Stu Ben. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. It, it becomes outside of yourself after a time and takes a life of its own. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 uh, the the people around the table and, and as they said at the intro, it wasn't just designers, but it was business managers, marketing people. There was a kind of awe when the 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 right idea hit the table and suddenly it was proclaimed as Stu Ben. So so I'm I'm I uh go on tap tap. Oh no I was just gonna comment that you know you were right about being in that room um with sometimes up to five designers at a time not to mention the creative director of which you were for a number of months or years um and there was that ephemeral quality that um you just knew it when you saw it, but you couldn't say you were really looking for it. Yeah. In particular. Yeah. But once you saw it, you knew it was there. That's it. Yeah. So, Steve, um, this all sounds very romantic, but there's a little bit about Tiger by the Tail as a business manager. Um, uh, t talk about your journey to joining Stu Ben. Well, well, it's interesting. So, I, I'm actually the one that I grew up here in Corning. Uh, so, I, I, I did grow up knowing what Stu Ben was. It, and there was Stuben in my house. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard not to be from Corning and, and certainly not know about Corning Glass and, and also about about Stuben. Um, you know, like like so many, growing up in a small town, you leave, and 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 I did, and was gone for a decade or more. And and uh, I come at this from from the business side, you know, from from sales and marketing, and and you know, eventually made my way back and. When I joined in 99, Stuben was just starting to get into the idea of e-commerce. And uh, so when I joined, I, I helped build and grow uh, an e-commerce presence for Stuben. But, you know, I think in listening to, to the th three of you, um, a couple of things come back to me. One was the quote that you started off with tonight. Uh, I remember reading that on my first day. It was like, you know, one of the things that you had to do, right? Especially in the sales and marketing side is, is to understand that it's, and, and this is probably true with, well, it's certainly true with art, but it's also true, I think, with a lot of luxury brands is that you're, you're not trying to come up with a product that you think is going to satisfy a, a specific need for a consumer, right? This is different. And while there are products that we have that, you know, whether it's an ornament or that sort of thing, that's a little more consumer driven. You do have to let the designers design and, and, and really let the market follow, uh, which is a really foreign thing to think about as somebody who, you know, comes from sales and marketing. Um, but, and as Taft said, you know, everybody, um, and not just, not just in the design world, but, uh, you know, you go down on the floor and you, 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 you know, the glass workers want to tell you, uh, their ideas and their thoughts and you know what they think and and everybody educates you and it, it takes a while to really appreciate um, and think about how you would put this product or this brand in, in front of people to uh, you know to to help tell this story because it's it's a really great story. It, it just uh, to build on that Steve I, I think the um you know, kind of all across the board from the folks who who were makers in the factory to um, the design community to the the business side of the house there was a re there is a reverence for Stuben that that I find to be um, exceptional there th this care of this precious thing and um, uh, I mean I'm in preparation for tonight I'm I'm getting wistful about uh, the magic that is uh, uh, working on dreaming up a new design for Stuben. Right. It's uh, 
it it's it never gets old and um i'm i'm in awe of um how active both taf and eric are today with uh designing new products for stuban and 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 eric can you just talk a little bit about how you sort of tease out an idea as you as you begin to explore um what's possible and i want to i want to sort of leverage that specifically on maybe what you think of as, as some of your most, one of your most memorable uh, projects you ever did for Stuban. Well, uh, there's one I'm, I'm very sentimental about, which was the very, one of the first ones in that house in Scotland. Uh, it's Innerland, which you now have in the museum. Um, it was one of the first pieces that uh, Stuban wanted to produce as a one of a kind piece. Uh, it's highly complex, as you know, uh, full of prisms and optical elements and it sort of ele the elements of mystery appear in it and you never quite know how one thing is joining to another. So illusion is one of the most interesting things that I'm always fascinated with in, on this earth and how all these differences that we look at when we think we're looking at something that turns out to be something else. The intercommunication between all the parts visually and the learning process and the way that people are enlightened by looking at it through discovery. So this piece to be full of that. In fact, there's a wee story where it was in the museum in, in, uh, in New York and you couldn't get near it for children because they were having a terrific time investigating what was happening inside of it. You know, the mind of the young is so important for us to uh, watch it develop and the okay and the other piece it's the piece that uh, is creation, which uh, was a, a commission we got uh, for the Santori Corporation in Japan. And a heck of a story about that. Uh, it's over six feet tall. And once again, it is full of complexity with all the sandblasting, the sand sculpting, the optical element. And it has to do with the preciousness of our earth, how the earth and what is happening to it now that we have to be so careful about, as many people are not being. Uh, this, this piece in its complexity looks a wee bit like the setting sun and it's together in this aluminum form that embraces the whole piece. These optical elements and deeply sculpted sandblasting design. And the elements of the design is this intercommunication of tiny parts, how they join together to make the whole, which is our earth. And uh, the water that's tumbling from it as an illusion, uh, it, uh, without the water, this earth, we would not be here. So mm -hmm. the pieces that I'm, I'm so happy about, uh, it was such an inventive thing for us to make it to Ben. Uh, it, and the other thing, just to bring bring out the comer, the, the, the inter, connectedness of the people at Stuben and the workers at Stuben and the way we had intercommunication together and discuss things. And it's like this piece was full of that as we made it. And going outside Stuben to a plant to have the uh, design the aluminum parts and go and watch all that coming together and being fitted. So anyway, the piece went off to uh, Japan to a symposium that was there and uh, I was flown out to put it up and put it up and uh, then I flew back and I had to go back a month later to take it down. When I got back, I decided, I discovered something was wrong with it. So now, <laughs> so, just flew that back to uh, Corning and we repaired what was wrong. And once again, I got another free trip to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, there's an adventure in, within the design itself, and then the actual uh, the installation and the making of it as well. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. So, um, so Eric, are you um, uh, and you continue to design for Stuben today? Yeah, they still want me around. Uh, there's a chap here called Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we look, there's so much camaraderie amongst us all. We've been through the mill and we've had our moments of anguish and happiness, and that's what makes humans be what they are. And the interconnectedness of understanding each other. Taff and I have done quite a few projects together. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, we've we've had we've had our arguments, we've had our friendships, we've had our <laughs> I mean, we've had a wonderful time together, and uh, we've gone places and we've uh, made things and commissions as staff remembers. Um, yes. I can't remember the what was the one with the golfing one that we did? Well, the Greenbrier Classic. Greenbrier Classic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's worth the worth bringing out that the when people think of Stuban, we think about the objects that are released every year, the annual um, roster of uh, products that are being made. But there also are, are special commissions, uh, one of a kind pieces. And uh, I know both Taff and Eric and, and I as, as well have have worked on those. And they really, as, as Eric described with the Suntory project, um, they really give you this canvas to explore in a way that um, is amazingly freeing. It goes all the way back to the top of the discussion of um, letting artists be artists and explore mm -hmm. the material. Yeah. Um, Taff, I, um, can you talk about iconic designs for you that have really um, uh, been, uh, been a highlight for you? Sure, I'd love to. Um, but one quick note about commissions. Um, yeah. One of the biggest thrills I had at Stuben, besides working on the Greenbrier with Eric, was um, doing a two foot long offhand dolphin. And it took like a, an entire team of us, engineers, glass blowers, me designing it. Um, I think I built a big model. And, but I had an opportunity to also um, sculpt a bronze wave and have that cast at a foundry and then finished and then it was all engineered so you could put the glass dolphin on top of the wave and it fit in perfectly and for me it was kind of the culmination of combining two of the things i i really love mm -hmm. glass and offhand glass and then cast bronze so uh a uh, team of glass blowers making the glass and then this right. parallel project of the of the metals really a metal sculpture that that complemented it yeah absolutely so i worked at um polish talix to um well i finished it up there in the wax and then they invested it and cast it and um i actually made a video about the whole thing um kind of as um, not only just a record of the production of it, but also I gave it to every single person in the plant so that they would have a record of themselves. And I got every single person in the plant in the video doing something with it. So to me, that was um, you know very gratifying. So it, it's interesting. So there's this, the, the, the triumvirate of material craftsmanship and design but the other thing that i'm hearing in this conversation is this binding quality of love <laughs> love for the material love for the process love of working with one another love of the exploration and um and that's a universal constant uh, uh, that's that's what makes Stuben Stuben. Yeah, absolutely and you know you can feel it when you're in the when uh, our old plant um you could just feel the the pride that people would take in their work um, from, you know, designers, glass blowers, finishers, engravers, you know, everybody had, and, and all the other people that don't know all the work about, you know, the whole process. It was, like you said, it was just a love of everything's to Ben. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Steve, uh, let's talk about uh, modern Stuben, which is now under the auspices of the Corning Museum of Glass and has been since 2013. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pride and responsibility that um, you have, but also we all have in carrying uh, on this legacy? Well, sure. Uh, you know, so having Stuben back and, and to be part of the Corning Museum of Glass uh, first of all, it's it's a bit like a homecoming for the brand. Uh, you know, for for many many years, the Stuben factory was was uh, literally conjoined to this uh, this museum, um, separate but uh, but still in a way together. Uh, visitors would come and they would watch activity on the Stuben factory floor, uh, and then also tour other parts of the of the museum. Um, you know, Stuben went through some challenging times in the really from the 70s on. And uh, in, in 2008, uh, Stuben was was sold from Corning uh, to a company from Ohio 
uh, who after a few years made the difficult decision to, to close the factory. Uh, but this idea now that it's part of the Corning Museum of Glass is again really brought it home. Um, we're back and being committed to leveraging what we've talked about all evening, which is this idea of great design, great material, and great craftsmen to bring these products back to life. So after a brief hiatus, uh, you know, pr production has restarted. These items are available again. New designs are being made. And, and all of the, the proceeds benefit the Corning Museum of Glass. So it's, it's really been a, a wonderful story. It's been very supported by by our customers. There's certainly still a, a great demand out there for all the things that Stuben represent. Mm. That's great. I'm um, to, to that end, we, uh, I'm going to dip into some of the questions that we're starting to see um, uh, come into the chat. And uh, the question about to Eric about, Eric, did you get your inspiration for Beacon of Light from Scotland or from the USA? Ah, yes. Well, um, Beacon of Light is a universal uh, uh, form. We hope that the Beacon of Light shines forth uh, into all sorts of different corners of our world. So it's symbolic as such, and the form was thus developed in this manner. Um, I'd just like to say one other beautiful thing that happened at Steben that uh, I was part of. Uh, it's, it was called Breaking the Mold. And this was the three three designers at Steben. That was myself and Peter Aldridge and David Dowler. And they opened up the plant to us for a year to allow us to make all these in incredible one of a kind pieces. And they were all in the Heller Gallery in New York. And it was a heck of a show because they were all major pieces. Each of us was let loose to do exactly what we wanted. So the camaraderie that went on and the investigation between all of the glass floors and the different processes that were used. It really was an incredible show. And the neat thing was people bought some of these pieces that had never been in Steben before. So going out into that gallery, there was a clientele came to that gallery that possibly wouldn't go to Steben. But by us being part of that particular gallery system, we somehow helped and then with the major pieces that we were doing at Steven, it would encourage these people to come in and see what was going on in the actual factory. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a well worth thing. I was amazed they did it because they opened the whole place up to us <laughs> and we could do exactly what we wanted. So I, I think it's, I think it's, <laughs> as a young designer at Steven at the time, and I, I designed the Fifth Avenue store's installation of that exhibition. So I, I, I got a chance to witness the, the, the making. I, yeah. It's amazing they let you loose in the factory uh, for a year, and it's also quite understandable that they never did it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, the point that they did it was important. Yeah, it was. It's fantastic. It really speaks. It really speaks to the uh, what we've talked been talking about all evening. The this this is a space for creative expression and glass and. How do you make that, that space uh, available to artists to explore and discover what the material can do? Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Taft, um, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure if this is for you or let's or, or Steve. Um, there are Christmas decorations. Um, there's a great uh, tradition of Christmas ornaments or holiday ornaments from Stuban. Um, is uh, uh, is Stuben still releasing new ornaments each year? Well, I'll, I'll start that and then maybe Taff can even talk a little bit about the process behind how this happens. But uh, the answer is yes. Uh, actually, when uh, Stuben had been been closed for a couple of years, when we uh, when we did start back up again in, in 2014, uh, we, we began uh, reintroducing some of the iconic designs. You mentioned the you know, the olive dish, which amazingly was introduced in 1939 and to this day is still a, a top selling uh, product for us. But uh, one of the first new designs was the annual holiday ornament. And uh, and Taff uh, graciously decided to uh, 
take a stab at, at the first one in a while and, uh, you know, a, a resounding success and uh, the tradition continues. So, uh, Taff, you might want to talk about, I see the the piece ornament is, is on the screen, so. Oh, That'd be great. great. Yeah, those are pretty instructive of the, um, the process of, of doing an ornament. Um, you know, sometimes being constrained by certain um, parameters helps you think more clearly about what you have to do to arrive at something that's going to be um, have the full intention of, of following through with the years of um, ornaments that we've done, but exploring each new concept um, or comp composition each year anew. Um, so I would generally start out, you know, we do a, a sketch and, and decide on, you know, actually start off with a list, just um, concepts and then a sketch. And then I would um, generally make it in clay, but but also sometimes in sculptor's wax, because then I could work on it hot and, and drip kind of drabs, little dribs and drabs of wax onto the composition to get the um, kind of a built-in optical look um, on top of the form. And um, I think I see the joy ornament maybe there or the peace ornament. Um, mm -hmm. Well, anyway, you see a mold there, so it would go from clay and then we'd, you know, make some refinements based on um, Steve and, and Terry and I talking and then move on to the uh, room temperature vulcanized mold of the piece. Um, and proving out the ability for the, the mold to actually open, the metal mold would happen just prior to my making a rubber mold. And then I would cast plasters into that mold and then refine them further. And then that would go off to a metal mold maker. So there were so many steps from clay and wax to a rubber mold, to plasters, to the metal mold. And sometimes it was an interim one that we would make out of plaster just to do maybe two or three blowings of the ornament in glass to just kind of test it out um, every year we do that. So Taff, that really leads me to uh, ask, ask both you and Eric the same question, which is, um, I, I remember as a, being a young designer at Steuben and um, uh, I had seen a similar process with one of Lloyd Atkins' classic hand coolers. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the plaster and all the, all the stuff you just described. And of course, you're looking at everything but glass. Right. Um, you you really uh, you really don't see the glass object till the, the bitter end, and um, you're kind of holding your breath. And here it comes uh, in glass for the first time. And I remember looking at the new hand cooler with Lloyd, and and I said, and it was amazing that the the, the sculpture of it was beautiful, just as the uh, we're seeing on the screen right now, but. Uh, so it's a lovely object, you know, that's opaque, but when it was rendered in glass, all these other effects come into play. This, it, 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 it breathes another, it springs to life. And I asked Lloyd, you know, how much of that did you anticipate? And he said, well, about half of it. <laughs> yeah, right. <Exactly. laughs> and, and is it, do you, is, do you find yourself in the same spot? Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking about that tonight, you know, in preparation for this chat and you know, it's almost like you have the subject and then you have the composition and then you have that mysterious quality of the reflections and the refraction that happens once it's in glass. And one of the things that I've noticed um, over 20 years of doing hand coolers is that in that small stylized framework, there's a place where a rounded form meets a, a flat edge and they're almost meeting in a square way but once one's flat and one's round and it creates an opportunity for reflections there that gives the whole thing a different life you know it just like you said it's it's a 50 50 proposition as to when it's going to happen you can coax it a little bit um you know having had experience doing that but then other times you know there's things happening with feet as compared to wings, 
and where the head is and it's just that's the that's the unknown factor that gets really exciting mm -hmm. and eric for for you I, i'm thinking specifically of something like innerland or prismatic objects that you've designed with with internal reflection you're essentially uh creating this almost like a hall of mirrors and trying to anticipate what what's going to be reflected in within that hall of those halls of mirrors and how much of that are you anticipating and how much of it is a delightful surprise well quite a bit of it's a, a hopeful just <laughs> surprise um i won't go any further with that at times but um the uh, we you start predicting more or less what possibly is going to happen it's like with these species that taff was showing you know when they when they come out of that mold as a glass object there's this injection of life force into the piece uh you know the beauty of the inter create the inter reflectivity and the form how it changes itself from the plaster model to this magical thing that is this creature shall we say whatever the subject matter is and it's a it's a similar thing with optical elements, especially when refraction takes place. So dancing rainbows appear to filter through the piece under certain conditions of sunlight or lighting. And you can play with these. Like one of the pieces I did, which was that hall of mirrors, where the wave went on into the distance of infinity. And every way you looked around the piece, the wave was going off in another direction. So you get the multiplicity of these waves creating an ocean. And like Innerland, which and, and the other thing I must I must say is the beauty of the engravers mm. work is the yeah. most fantastic in a world of people who do that kind of thing. It's so recognized. One of my dear friends, Max Erlacher, who's a very famous uh, um, engraver, him and I have been friends ever since I started working at Stuben. Uh, he's another terrific engraver and he worked on Innerland and the leaves and the different aspects of the piece filter together and come alive. It, uh, it's, you try to create a magical experience. That's what you now we actually have a question about um, uh, will, will uh, Stuben return to the use of copper wheel engraving um, at, at some points in the future, and I'll put that question to Steve. Well, actually, we still do. Uh, I think uh, we have a picture of, of one of Eric's pieces called Ocean's Pulse, which is um, in some ways similar to Innerland in, in that it's it's blocks of glass that are all copper wheel engraved. Um, we've also, uh, in fact, even, even Max Erlacher has been involved in some of the other special commission projects that we've been doing recently. Uh, so uh, while it's it's not as common in as many of our pieces as it once was, it's still certainly a technique uh, that, that we appreciate and, and do utilize. Steve, another question for you is um, uh, how Steve, how um, Stuban has been able to um, connect with uh, fans, and I would call them fans, uh, um, all really all around the world. It, it, it's the one point of sale for Stuben today physically is in Corning and then of course online, but um, there, there are legions of fans all around the world. If, I don't know if you want to reflect on that. Well, that's that's right. And, you know, again, I, I came into this in the world of e-commerce and, and uh, it certainly turned out to be fortuitous. I mean, it, it, it's been a great, a great way for us to continue to, uh, to, to market, but uh, you know, in, in today's world, with even with events like this, um, you know, with social media, uh, so we, we certainly have a presence and, and we uh, do all that we can to try and, you know, keep the brand in front of people and encourage people to share the story. Uh, and, and then certainly, you know, the, the product obviously uh, speaks, speaks for itself. You know, it's 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 a difficult consumer behavior you know that's something you know we can we can study but as we've been talking about all night Stuvend Stuvend is a brand that it doesn't really sell product um, you know it sells this idea of quality and this idea of, of elegance uh, there's you know I think when I one of the things we try and remember as on the business and sales side is that Stuvend is a way for someone who wants to magnify something 
important that's happening in their life, in their family, in their company. Uh, you know, that's that's why they come to Stuben. And, uh, you know, as, as long as we can continue to marry this, uh, these elements of great design, craftsmanship, uh, material, and, and present it in this elegant way, uh, you know, I think Stuben has a good future. Um, it, it, that really takes me to uh, uh, one of my strongest memories of, of working at Stuben was, um, you know, this this is a decorative object, right? These are, they, they may have a, a simple function, a candy bowl, a, uh, a, a drinking glass, but there's there's a deeper beauty and, and meaning behind um, so many Stuben objects. And um, I uh, received a letter when I was um, associate design director at Stuben from a customer, and it and it was describing a, a bowl that they had bought, a Stuben bowl they had bought that had broken. And I thought it was a you know kind of a customer service letter. They're saying my bowl broke and I want it replaced. But no, what what it was is they then wrote about how this bowl lived in their house and where it sat on the on the sat on the piano and the light would come in at a certain time of the day and illuminate it in such a way and the joy that it brought in their lives and how the cat would sometimes climb up on the piano and sleep in the bowl and and how it survived a, a divorce and where it ended up and and I I showed this I showed this letter to the then president of Stuban who always was really uh, kind of pushing on kind of the function of Stuban. And I said, you know, it really, this really illustrates that, that the function of Stuban is that it's an object that holds memories. Mm. And, 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 and that really, in so many ways, it, it raises, this has been a discussion about design and design intent, but it really raises the stakes in terms of what, what's going on here. We're, we're making these beautiful, intriguing objects that are precious that find their way into people's lives and touch them in ways that you don't expect uh, i always recommend that people never you know put their student objects in a curio cabinet put them live with them have them out in the same way that person described it living in their in their life and uh, um, uh at any rate a a, a a vessel and a container for memories is is in many ways what what, what we create and do yeah, and to that point, there's the um, every year we do the uh, Valentine's Day heart, and that is another receptacle mm. for memories, and uh, and then uh, people like to have their their names um, or their anniversary put on the heart, you know, and someone's giving it as a gift of love, and it it embodies the the whole process, you know, because you have the design, you have the glass, you have the engraving, you have the the embodiment of that personal quality built right into the glass and they take it home and it's just a treasure that's 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 a beautiful thing and so um and and this work continues the uh both Taf, uh and eric uh you you continue to ponder this puzzle of stuben and what's next what what other design lies uh within this material you haven't discovered yet and um and, and eric uh uh, before we close, I'd, I'd love to, Tom Beekner, um, then president of Stuben, sent you back to Scotland to think about designs <laughs> for Stuben. Now you live in the in the beautiful countryside of the Finger Lakes and and, and still engage in in thinking about that. What's what's your what's your creative inspiration? Where where do you turn as you think about what's next? <clears throat> well, I, I've got to tell you this wee story that. I kind of came up with, and, and it's kind of to do with Stuben and not quite. Um, all summer long, uh, the hummingbirds came to visit us. Mm -hmm. And that journey they take of 2,000 odd miles to finally arrive at this uh, part of this country where I was watching them and there was eight, ten of them fluttering around. And it gave me an idea. Outside our house, there's a kind of open space in the woods. So I am going to build uh, a form that looks like a Pictish brock. Now these were rotunda like forms in Scotland and from Neolithic times. On top of that, George Kennard, who is the glass maker in the museum, him and I are going to make a crystal, a glass form in such a way 
in the position of this um, small monolith standing in this open space. And within that form, we're going to put little hummingbird feeders. So when the spring comes and forms into summer this year, and around the, uh, the, the, the stone broch that we're going to build, there'll be all these flowers so the hummingbirds can dance amongst the flowers. And we'll create it in such a way that the birds fly into and around the glass forms and dance within them by illusion. So that's what I'm trying to do, as just a, 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 something full of inspiration with what's going on on the earth right now and how forms and the, the life on our planet is in a precarious state <clears throat> and has to be protected. And it's not that, just to give some beauty to the thing and raise our spirits with what's going on around us right now. Okay. So, Thank you, Eric. I, I have to jump in and, and just kind of think back to, you know, imagine this being brought into the room, right? As as the concept for the next the next <laughs> thing that we wanna we wanna work on and figure out how to market. It's 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 inspiring to to uh, to hear Eric speak and it um, it's a challenge as well then to think how would you uh, how would you help turn this into something that could be a product. Yeah. It's, it really, it really uh, distills that essence of Stuben of, of uh, beginning as it, we began at the top of the of the hour. That quote about uh, leading with the artist and um, seeing what what inspires them and how can it um, how can it turn into a product? How can it become this magical thing that people all refer to as Stuben? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, Steve and uh, Eric and Taft for, for joining us in this conversation tonight. It's, it's uh, a joy to be back with you um, and talking about our, uh, one of our favorite subjects. Um, I want to thank all of our viewers for tuning in and joining in, in the conversation. Uh, thank you for weighing in on the Q&A. Um, um, uh, it's, it's been a real honor to, to uh, be part of this conversation. Um, and really to see this joyful, uh, this joyful reality of what it is to explore Stuban as a material for designers. Um, so again, thank you, uh, Taff and Eric, especially for being part of the conversation. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks. thanks. See you soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. Uh, th this episode of Connected by Glass will be added to our YouTube uh, channel along with previous episodes uh, featuring such wildly divergent topics as fiber optics, the Netflix series Blown Away, and the latest episode about the glass ballot box used in elections of the past. If you enjoying Connected by Glass, please consider supporting the Corning Museum of Glass so we can continue to bring you compelling content in this, um, in this exciting way. We'll be back with another episode of Connected by Glass soon. Um, so please look for more details on our social media. We also hope you've uh, been inspired to see glass in a new light. Um, certainly, uh, Taff and Eric and I have been inspired to see glass in a new light throughout our exploration with Stuben. Um, so uh, if you'd like to get updates from Stuben, you can join uh, the email list at stuben.com and follow Stuben on Facebook and Instagram and, and see what uh, is getting cooked up next. We'll invite you also to explore the exciting world of glass at the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, please visit our website, cmog.org, cmog.org, to plan your visit. And um, once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being part of this uh, lively conversation. And uh, take care and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night.